Colony by Rob Grant Read by Mark Williams Eddie O'Hare considers himself the unluckiest man in the entire cosmos, and bluntly, he's got a damn fine point. He's standing at the smoke glass window that takes up an entire wall of a top-floor room in a hastily built hotel, staring down at the crowds thronging the neon-splattered street below. Tomorrow, the streets will be empty. The town will die. There'll be no reason for it anymore. And unless his luck changes, Eddie's going to die along with it. In his sweating fist, he's clutching his one last hope. A single gaming chip. A fifty. He's trying hard to think of the number he should place it on. If he can do this one thing right, then all he has to do is pick another right number. And then, the last and final thing he has to do is let all those winnings ride on just one more right number. He has to pick three right numbers. That's all. Maybe a hardcore gambler could convince himself he could ride that tide, but Eddie's not even a softcore gambler. He's an accountant. He can work out the odds. He can't help himself. 46,656 to 1. That's what it'll take to turn this sweaty gaming chip into the two and a quarter million he owes. Face it, Eddie, it's not going to happen. His reflection looks back at him from the blue smoke glass. The spectre shakes its head in sympathetic disbelief. It's not as if it's even Eddie's fault that he's living this nightmare. The money was stolen by a computer. One nanosecond it was there, the next it wasn't. No sign the system had been accessed from the outside. The computer just up and disappeared the money. And for reasons currently unfathomable to Eddie, it left behind an electronic trail that led to him. He's been framed for a non-existent crime by a mass of wires and hot electrical circuits. Now you try explaining that to the... to those kind of people. No. Eddie was left with just two alternatives. Somehow replace the money before it was missed, or spend the rest of eternity as a small portion of the foundations of some unfinished hotel. So he liquefied as much of his assets as possible in the time, and headed for what he considered to be the fairest casino in town. It had taken him seventeen years of virtuous thrift and parsimonious self-denial to amass his pitiful savings. It took considerably less than 17 minutes to lose it all. So, now, here is Eddie O'Hare in a hotel suite the casino reserves for its biggest high rollers, clutching a 50 chip some big-time winner has tossed him in pity. Eddie sees the big hole appear in the door before he hears the sound of the gunshot. A huge smoked window he's gazing through cracks across the middle and the top half collapses. The door has already been kicked down, and two men are standing in the doorway, silhouettes against the corridor's glow. Tight-fitting grey suits, ties as thin as stiletto blades, trousers slightly too short, exposing fluorescent pink socks above black suede loafers. The first man grabs him firmly under his arms as the second man arrives, his gun freshly holstered. He grabs Eddie behind the knees, and they swing him back, ready to pitch him through the window. The first man speaks. Mr. Bevedino would really like to know where his money is. Eddie looks out of the window at what has suddenly become a beautiful night sky. A thought strikes him. Don't think I recall him, Mr. Bevedino. The man with the holstered gun lowers Eddie's legs. You better not be wasting my time. He walks to the door, which is prone. He looks down, then looks over at his colleague. This is 888. The man with an arm lock on Eddie says, You sure? It looked like 886. Yeah. There's a little nick out of the last eight. Makes it look like a six. The man releases Eddie and reaches into his pocket. He tugs out a pathetically slim wallet and finds some ID. You Edward O'Hare? Eddie nods. You're not Harrison Doppel? Eddie tries as hard as he can not to look anything like anything any Harrison Doppel might possibly look like. The man hands him back his wallet. What can I say? You're not our next appointment. This is uncustomarily unprofessional. Don't mention it. I'd hate you to think we go around throwing people out of windows willy-nilly. He crosses towards his companion. Eddie realises that, for some reason, he's waiting to breathe properly until the men have gone. A Fortunado City has just one night to live. Its one long street is a chaos of humanity. Thousands of people who will have no need of money tomorrow, eager to spend what they've got. Stepping out of the hotel on the very perimeter of town, Charles Perry Gordon experiences the closest he's ever come to a sense of fulfilment. He imagined this town. He conjured it up, reclining in his big leather chair at his desk in his office in Rio. It was a place that, to Gordon's mind, simply had to exist. 
The project is the biggest operation ever undertaken by the human race, with a budget to match. It employs tens of thousands of people and pays them extravagantly well. Naturally, they needed somewhere to dispose of their income and blow off steam, and Afortunado was born to give them somewhere to do just that. A pleasure city, carved out of the unforgiving desert of snow. An oasis, it's been called. And though Gordon's seen it many times in his head, this is his first brush with the wonderful reality of it. Standing at the top of the steps, he looks left at the shimmering heat haze of the hot wall, the thermal barrier that separates the town from the lethal wilderness of the Antarctic peaks that surround it. Across the street, a group of youths in Bermuda shorts are tossing empty beer cans through the barrier just to watch them flare and vanish. Without the hot wall, their life expectancy would be measured in minutes. Sometime tomorrow, when the last of the temporary town's inhabitants have straggled onto the last of the transports, the wall will be powered down. Within a week, a Fortunado city will be buried under tons of compacted ice and snow, reclaimed by the wasteland from which it was carved. Gordon predicted that too. There's a dull explosion overhead. Gordon looks up. A large sheet of blue smoke glass is tumbling from the top floor of the Hotel Felicity. The crowd below does its best to scatter, but the bodies are packed pretty tightly on Easy Street tonight, and a few are too close to the impact. As the window shatters on the pavement, sending dozens of lethal projectiles towards the terrified stragglers. Gordon steps over a screaming woman. The screeching is annoying him. He wants to get away from it. He sees the sign for the Felicity Casino and decides he might as well spend his money in there. He kicks away the injured hand that's clawing at him and skips down the steps. Eddie is looking out of the wall-to-ceiling void that used to be his window. He's staring down at the street he almost became a part of. Another man might be thinking what a lucky escape he's just had. Not Eddie. Eddie's frozen in the glaring truck headlights of fear. This is Eddie's problem. Eddie's a do-nothing guy. He unconsciously subscribes to the theory that the best way to tackle a terrible twist of events is first and foremost do absolutely nothing. Because doing something, anything, might very well make the terrible thing worse. So, here's old Eddie waiting. When there's another muffled explosion, another shattering of glass, and another window lazily tumbles down the side of the Hotel Felicity's hasty façade. The fellows are paying a visit next door. The scene just rehearsed in his life is now being replayed in Room 886, only for real. Eddie was just a stand-in. Now his part is being taken by the real star, Harrison Doppel. There are angry shouts, then a dreadful silence. Eddie looks away, but too late to avoid registering the look on Harrison Doppel's suddenly silent face as gravity grabs him at the top of his upward arc. That look will be burned into Eddie's brain forever. The soon-to-be-late Mr. Doppel doesn't look afraid. He doesn't look angry. He's smiling. It'll take Eddie a while to interpret that smile correctly. In fact, Harrison Doppel is smiling in disbelief. He can't believe the death is actually definitely going to happen to him. To him! Eddie moves away from the window. He doesn't want to hear the impact, much less see it. The momentum carries him out of the flattened door of his suite and down the corridor. He turns his face away from the flattened door of 886 as he passes. Pointlessly, as it turns out, a full-length mirror spans the corridor opposite the suites, and Eddie unwittingly makes nerve-grinding eye contact with the killer's reflections. Eddie tries to smile in a way that demonstrates he still feels a kind of recent acquaintance-type affinity with them, without actually appearing either to condone or condemn their... career decision. One of them acknowledges it with a brief distracted nod before returning his attention to his grim list. Eddie reaches the lifts, and even though the casino's in the basement and he's nine stories above it, the furious noise of the place swills into the elevator car long before it gets there and spills Eddie out into the greedy chaos. This is only his second visit to a casino. The first was just a few hours ago, and it lasted less than a quarter of an hour. Eddie turns the 50 chip over in his hand, his last sweaty link to any kind of future, and tries to work out where to be. A roulette table, certainly, but which one? He scours the unwelcoming room for a sign of some kind, and then a magical thing happens in Eddie's totally unmagical life. In the far corner... One of the tables has a flashing arrow pointing to it, and a message in lights reads, Eddie to win. He pushes his way over to the table and looks up at the sign again, but now it's reading, Ready to win? Can he really have misread it? 
It doesn't matter. For once, in this long and staccatically violent night, Eddie truly feels he's in the right place at the right time. Now, all you have to do is pick the right number three times. With just three correct guesses, he'll have the two and a quarter millions he owes, with a little under 83 grand left over. Piece of cake, my friend. Slice of gatto. And what is the number for Eddie? His birthday? No. No one could call that a lucky number day. His age? The length of his penis in inches? Then Eddie sees something. A man, the same build, same colouring. A man who looks so like Eddie, even Eddie has to look twice. The biggest difference between the two of them is that this man, this non-Eddie, is calm. His hand isn't sticky and sweaty, and he's putting a large pile of sweat-free chips on a single number. With a scientist's disdain for superstition, he's putting it all on 13. In a flash of certainty that goes far beyond confidence, that's where Eddie puts his sticky lifeline of a chip, 13. And now the silver ball's slowing down. Its orbit is decaying. It's tinkling now against the compartments of the whirling wheel, bouncing back to the outer rim and clattering again into the wheel. And now the ball has stopped, but the wheel's still spinning, so you can't quite see what number the ball is resting in, and it looks like... it looks like... Wait. Is that 13? That's Eddie's number. He's one. Eddie jumps and punches the air. He looks around to share his wide-eyed joy, but all eyes are on Eddie's doppelganger, who has clocked up closer to 36,000. The croupier stretches out to push the winnings towards him, but he holds up his hand and nods down at the table. He's going to let it ride. 36,000 on the spin of a ball. Plus the stake, Eddie's accountant mind adds. 37 grand. And now the croupier is about to shunt Eddie's meagre haul towards him. But Eddie holds up his hand. Can he really be doing this? It's all too late now. No amount of sensibleness can take back what he's done. The wheel's slowing down now, and the little silver ball makes one last hop, one last clack, and bobbles into the thirteen slot. Bobbling. Bobbling. And it stays there. Around Eddie, people are shouting silently. They're probably making a noise others could hear, but Eddie's on a different level. He looks up at his likeness, and they share a private look before the noise thunders back into Eddie's world. Eddie now has over 68,000. Small change compared to the Eddie-esque fellow on whose luck Eddie is piggybacking, just under 1.37 million is due in that direction. Eddie is getting ready to gather his chips, but Eddie's look-alike holds up his hand again and nods towards the 13 square once more. The croupier looks troubled. This is way over the floor limit. She shoots a glance towards a serious-looking individual who pauses a second and nods his permission. Eddie is finding it hard to breathe. The croupier reaches to push out Eddie's comparatively small pile and cocks her head quizzically. For the first time ever, Eddie's on a winning streak. He's going to do it. He's raising his hand and turning his head towards the Eddie look-alike to exchange a smile of mutuality when he stops. The Eddie look-alike isn't looking at him. He's looking at his watch. Then over towards the exit. What is this? Tens of millions at stake on this spin. And the man is bored? It suddenly dawns on Eddie that this man doesn't care about winning or losing. Not because he's rich. He's beyond rich. He's with the project. He's a bona fide pilgrim. And tomorrow morning, and for the rest of his life, he'll be living in a world where money doesn't matter. He'll be leaving the planet Earth with all its concerns, all its pleasures and its pains and its currencies behind. Eddie can't risk his life on that basis. He changes the motion of his hand, beckoning for his winnings. The croupier shrugs, what does she care, and sweeps Eddie's chips over to him. Now he has to get away from the table, quickly. He must never find out where that ball winds up on this spin. He turns from the table. Is this a real silence, or is it one of Eddie's perceived silences? It's real, all right. It's broken by the croupier's voice. Thirteen, black. Under the tumult that follows, Eddie tries not to do two sums, but naturally he fails. He's turned his back on over two and a half million, and the man who wanted to lose has just netted a fortune in the region of fifty million six hundred and fifty three thousand tax free. Eddie needs a drink. But first he staggers over to the cash window and tips his winnings into the dip on the counter. The cashier asks him if he wants cash, but Eddie shakes his head and changes them for the largest chips they have. He heads for the bar and orders his drink. So, what's the plan now? He needs one more number. 
One more successful bet, that's all. There's a furore behind him, but Eddie's wrapped up in his own little furore. He needs a number. He looks for a sign, but sees nothing. The bartender presents the bill. Absently, Eddie says to put it on his room. The bartender asks for his room number. Eddie says 888. And he's off his bar stool and standing at the nearest roulette table, which is surprisingly devoid of custom. Eddie puts his chips down on the number eight. The croupier ignores him. He's talking to a waitress. Eddie coughs. Excuse me, is this table closed? The croupier turns and looks at Eddie's bet. Are you serious? Deadly serious. 68,450 serious. The croupier offers a facial shrug to the waitress who giggles flirtatiously and with an exaggerated flourish she spins the wheel. This time, Eddie has no nerves. There's no feeling of suspense. No doubts. Just a cool, unshakable conviction that the ball will bobble into compartment number eight. And it does. Sweet as a teat. Eight, black. Two million, five hundred thousand. He's safe, he's free, he's going to live. But the croupier doesn't acknowledge the win. Eddie thumps the table hard. What about my bet? The croupier looks up. You won? 68,450 globals, all on numero eight, my friend. The croupier registers the Tower of Chips and nods. That's right, you won your bet. Congratulations. Then he collapses into a bizarre giggling fit. The waitress joins in. Eddie grabs the guy by the lapels. Look, you can fool around all you want to, friend, but first, you have to pay me my winnings. The croupier waves his hand expansively at the neat banks of chips by the wheel. Take it. Take all of it. He gently removes Eddie's hands from his waistcoat lapels. Didn't you hear, Pilgrim? The casino's closed down. Some lucky son of a bitch won fifty million, broke the bank. All bets are off. Eddie looks round. The casino certainly does have an after-the-party look about it. The staff are chatting in groups. He gathers his wits. I didn't win the bet. Those chips are what? Worthless? The croupier shrugs. Eddie simply stands for a while, waiting for his skin to stop buzzing. But that isn't going to happen any time soon. He turns towards the exit. He has no idea where he can go from here. He is the walking dead. He's a zombie. Now it is on the street. He doesn't know how far from the casino. Some sound has snapped him out of his shocked state. He glances to his left. A man is on the floor, being kicked mercilessly by two other men. Eddie registers the pink fluorescent socks, swinging with business-like regularity. Eddie wonders how far down the alphabet the boys are now. If Eddie is on their list, he's probably got an hour or even two before they work their way down to the O's. Though, of course, some systems classify O'Hare under H, in which case he's probably got considerably less time. There's a low-rent tavern over the road. Eddie crosses. Pussy's open the door and steps in. He's in a bar. The darkest bar Eddie's ever been in. The major light source is a handful of neon alcohol brand signs over by the serving area. The dismal illumination these provide is dissipated by thick plumes of mostly illegal smoke. His arm experiences an involuntary jerk. There's another. And another. Before Eddie realises someone's tugging his arm with increasing urgency, a final tug impels him into a chair. He's in a booth. Eddie wonders what kind of person would require the additional privacy of a booth in a place like this, a place where the bar staff would require infrared night scopes just to collect the empty glasses. He peers through the gloom. A voice says, Recognise me? I'm sorry, friend, said Eddie. It's pretty dark in here. I can barely recognise me. Well, that's good, because I want you to stop being you. The voice gets close, bearing on its breeze the aroma of expensive cigar. From now on, I'd like you to start being me. Eddie tries, pointlessly, to pinpoint the incumbent of the seat opposite and meets his invisible gaze. You want us to swap identities? No. No, why would I want to be you? No, I want to be me as well. I just want you to stop being you and start being me. Eddie wonders if he can leap up and reach the door before this madman produces a chainsaw and starts on some kind of rampage. But if I become you, he says, who's going to be me? Eddie spots a red circle opposite. It glows briefly illuminating the lower face of the man who wants Eddie to be him, then darts out of sight. Memory clicks with Eddie. It's you. You're him. You're the man who won. The man hisses. Keep it down. I'm trying to keep a low profile. 
I shouldn't be here at all, friend. I should be at the project. Of course. Eddie had already spotted the man as a pilgrim. I see. You expected there, but now that you've... Precisely. Circumstances alter cases. I'm a very rich man now, and I'd like to enjoy this money. I don't want to join the project any more. And who would blame you, says Eddie? They could. And they will. Point taken. Pilgrims were the modern equivalent of kamikaze pilots. Their families were richly provided for. Their debts were all written off. In return, they signed an ironclad contract. The mission demanded a full complement. Desertion would be ferociously, and if the rumours were true, terminally discouraged. To Eddie, it sounded like a fine deal in the making. Eddie O'Hare would avoid the lethal retribution awaiting him by ceasing to exist, and in exchange he'd become a member of an elite group of Earth's finest, the best of the best, on a lifelong voyage to the stars. For the rest of his life, his every need would be provided for. In theory, the crew of the Willflower represented the cream of humanity. It was an honour to be numbered among the selected. They were prepared not merely to dedicate their lives to the project, but the lives of their unborn children and their unborn children's children. For, even travelling at the fantastic speeds it hoped to achieve, the Willflower would take several lifetimes to reach its destination. Its objective was the nearest Earth-like planet, wherever that was. The crew of the Willflower would ready this planet for the mass exodus of the human race from its original home. The project was the last and only hope for the long-term survival of the human species. As for Eddie, the prospect of ceasing to exist is not only the best thing that's been put on his table tonight, it's the best thing that ever happened to him. All right. Say I agree. Let's say I become you. How would I pull that off? Who are you, anyway? I am... You are Charles Perry Gordon. Eddie is aware of document files being pushed across the table. Everything you need to know is in here. You're a community planner. I'm a what? Relax. It's a walk in the park. If anybody asks you a question, all you need is an opinion. It doesn't even have to be a good opinion. It'll take years before anyone realises you don't know what you're talking about. It's... How would the Americans distort the language? A totally no-risk scenario. The question is, how can I be sure you'll keep to the bargain? And with difficulty, because saying it out loud, admitting it, explaining it to another person makes it seem even more terrifyingly hopeless, Eddie tells him. He tells him about his situation. And the real Mr. Gordon doesn't express sympathy, doesn't remark on Eddie's luck. He simply relaxes in the darkness and holds out his hand across the table. So, we have a deal. Eddie senses, rather than sees the proffered hand, and without thinking it through, offers his own. Poor Eddie. Eddie's a new man, literally. He has a new identity, new papers, a new career. He has a future. His dilemma now is when to start walking the few short steps towards the security gate. But the decision is made for him. To his right, he hears a pleading yell and a scuffle. The guards barely flick their eyes in the direction of the altercation. But Eddie knows what it is. Two men, sporting bright pink socks, are swinging a third man between them, trying to work up sufficient momentum to hurl him over the laser safety cutouts and into the lethal thermal wall. Eddie's still several steps away from the guards before the scream and the flash occur. He goes up to the security gate and flashes his ID, hoping this will be enough to get him through. It isn't. One of the guards holds his hand out, and Eddie's forced to pass it over. The guard seems to be comparing Eddie's face with the photo. This shouldn't be a major problem. After all, it's a photo of Eddie, taken only minutes ago. The guard looks up. Mr. Gordon, glad you could make it. They were just about to push the button on you. He reaches out for Eddie's left hand before Eddie can react. If you don't mind, sir, we just need to check your DNA signature. Before Eddie can protest, he feels a prickling sensation in his arm and hears the hiss of his blood being withdrawn. Is this absolutely necessary? Just a formality, says the guard, and inserts the vial 
into his desktop console. The jig is surely up. Even if he were good at bluffing, which he isn't, Eddie couldn't bluff his way through a DNA mismatch. The computer emits a series of unpromising sounds. The guard turns from the screen and looks at Eddie. Well, you could have saved us a little time here, couldn't you? In what way? You might have mentioned this is the first time you've reported to the project, that your DNA wasn't on record. Well, smiles Eddie, it is now. The guard grunts, hands the wallet back and nods towards the embarkation point. There are only a couple of other passengers on the shuttle, and neither of them pay much attention to Eddie. One of them is an extremely good-looking woman, the other an earnest, honest-looking man in a dog collar. They are both working. Eddie should be working too. He should be ploughing through C.P. Gordon's files. He should know who he actually is, what he does. He should know who his colleagues are, who he reports to, who reports to him. It would be nice to have the odd autobiographical fact to hand too, like his mother's name, his nationality, his sexual orientation, all those little details that might trip him up. It might even be handy to find out what the consequences would be if he does get tripped up. Will they give him a sharp slap on the wrist and withdraw a few privileges, or will they stuff him into a garbage canister and shoot him into space through the waste disposal? But as the shuttle lifts off, Eddie can only look out through the window and wonder how to feel as a Fortunado shrinks away, as he leaves his life behind, as he leaves the planet Earth behind. When the last light from the tallest tower is definitely no longer visible, Eddie finally grabs hold of the file spreads the papers over his seat table and sighs like a bouncy castle going down. Gordon has agreed to pay off his debt and send a million to Eddie's mother's bank account. No loose ends, everybody happy. There is another sigh, almost simultaneous and almost as contented on the ground. Gordon has watched Eddie board and take off. He smiles very broadly. He has no intention, naturally, of paying off Eddie's debt or sponsoring Eddie's mother, touching and cute as the dismal thought might be. No, he has good use for his money. He can use it to sow the seeds of the perfect society he's dreamed of here on Earth, not far away on a spaceship bound for distant worlds. In a little under four hours, the will flower will have launched. In a little under four and a half hours, Gordon, looking suitably beaten up and bedraggled, will file a report to the effect that a man answering Eddie O'Hare's description jumped him, drugged him, and stole his identity papers. O'Hare will be arrested and dealt with. It will, of course, be too late for Gordon to join the mission. No loose ends. Everybody happy. As Eddie bundles out of the shuttle, Still trying to stuff the papers back in the file, he almost collides with a very serious-looking group of individuals standing at the entrance to a huge cylindrical tower. One of them, a silver-tinged, black-bearded man of indeterminable age, holds out his hand. Mr. Gordon, I presume, he booms. Community Director Gwent. Great. This bundle of fun, who looks like he's Eddie's superior, drapes a matey arm round his shoulders and steers him towards the cylinder's entrance. Eddie knows what this is. It's the famous stairway to heaven, officially designated as one of the seven wonders of the modern world. The Willflower is much more than a spaceship. It's a city, a mobile metropolis built for space travel, put together in orbit above the point of least spin, the South Pole. It's tethered to the Earth, by the tallest structure in human history, the hoist. Known romantically as the stairway to heaven, the hoist is a giant elevator that ferries supplies and personnel to and from the ship. Gwent makes some remark, and now the assembled group is staring at Eddie. Clearly, he's been asked a question, and he's failed to respond. A thin woman, attractive even though her dark hair is dragged back in a severe bun, steps in. Are you perhaps... Buying time, Mr. Gordon, or is it that a true and honest answer might damn you and your profession? Further dithering is definitely out of the question. He elects to go bold. Absolutely not. I, I would say, on the whole, my response would be positive. There is a small but deep silence. It's broken by Gwent's guffaw, and he's led onward towards the great tower. Gwent leans closer to him. You'll have to forgive Section Leader Peck. She's a hard, hard scientist, 
It's a religion with her. Anything less than pure mathematics belongs in the waste compactor just above psychology. They're in the tower now, and stepping into what must be the elevation tube itself. It's... Well, it's large. The source of the Nile could be lurking in one of the corners, and you'd never find it. Your first trip, Mr. Gordon, and my last. Come. The double doors slide closed, the airlock whispers, and the room lurches. The ice falls away, and the spectacular view is now the monochrome blue-black of a polar night sky. Then the window is filled with white again, as the hoist achieves cloud height. Gwent holds up her finger and listens. Fans kick in. Fifteen thousand feet, oxygen required. And then the cloud falls away. A cannon goes off in Eddie's ear. Gwent! The edge of the troposphere. No weather above this point. No more weather for us, Charles. We've cursed our last rain shower, constructed our last snow person, squealed through our last sea squall. Humbling? No? And now suddenly there is a view. An astonishing clear bright view of the stars and space beyond, unhindered by atmosphere. The clouds break up and curl into wisps and smoky strands over the ball of the strangely fragile earth beneath them. This is humbling. Even Eddie, who is, let's get real, not exactly unhumble anyway, is further humbled by this view. So he isn't the only one who fails to see Gwent draw a gun. He is, however, the first to leap back at the sound of the weapon cocking, and he cowers the lowest as the barrel of the gun booms, and the transparent wall through which they'd all just been admiring the view smashes spectacularly, to be replaced by what Eddie can only think of as a big hole. And out of this big hole charges the air that Eddie had planned to be breathing for the next few minutes of the trip. Eddie's lungs are being dragged inside out. His tongue feels like it's unravelling. He looks back towards Gwent, whose greasy silver-black hair is whipping forwards all over his grinning face. Watch! he bellows. Eddie forces his face towards the rupture. Bizarrely, it's beginning to shrink in size. He blinks. No? The hole is definitely getting smaller, and as the fissure diminishes to non-life-threatening dimensions, the sound of escaping oxygen decreases, and Eddie can hear the material in the wall knitting itself back together. In less than 90 seconds after the gunshot, the rupture has repaired itself, and no evidence of any damage remains. Eddie is still curled over, like a Lowry hunchback, with one hand on the floor. The other occupants of the hoist are calmly smoothing back their hair and unruffling their clothes. Spectacular demonstration, eh, Charles? Gwent drags an expensive comb through his steely locks and briskly fluffs up his beard. The material from which this beauty is constructed is organic, a synthetic living fabric, airtight, stronger than steel, and self-repairing. The ship is constructed from the same material. There's a jolt, and everyone staggers as the upward motion ceases. Then a series of clicks and whirs. As machinery negotiates with machinery, the hoist has reached its destination. They are docking. They are aboard the Willflower. Eddie's quarters are fine. Luxurious, even. Far better than you could reasonably expect. He deflates himself into an armchair, which surprises him by moulding its seat to the precise contours of his ass. Some semi-organic achievement in soft furnishings, probably. He'd like to sleep for about a century. He'd also like a month in a bubble bath, so he could soak away the fear sweat that's built up all over his body over the course of the past few hours. But he can't afford these luxuries just yet. There's a lot of work to be done if he's going to stand even a remote chance of passing himself off as Charles Perry Gordon. He selects a wad of papers at random from Gordon's file, focuses on the first page and leans back in the chair. This is a mistake. The chair back moulds itself around his shoulders and starts thrumming a gentle massage that melts his aching muscles. His eyes begin to close. Eddie snaps bolt upright as a buzzer sounds, and Gwent's face appears in what Eddie had assumed to be a genuine fish tank. Something's come up. Be in planning committee room one in five. And his image splinters into a dozen koi carp. Eddie's out of the door and round three twists of corridor, desperately scanning Gordon's notes without focusing on them in the stupid hope that clusters of vital facts might 
just register with his subconscious mind before he realises he doesn't have a clue where planning committee room one is. He stops and looks around, as if there might be a sign on one of the walls or maybe even a you are here machine with buttons and lights. No such luck. He employs his last resort. He asks someone for directions. Ignoring the expression that seems to suggest he's inquired for the route to his own head, he commits the first paragraph of the ludicrously complicated itinerary to memory and scoots off, becoming hopelessly lost within moments. By the time Eddie finally achieves his destination, he's past caring. He feels quite prepared to be shot out into deep space in a garbage canister. He's looking forward to it. Planning Committee Room 1 is astonishingly opulent. Maybe two dozen people are seated around a polished wood table in leather-back chairs. Gwent at the head bellows, Mr Gordon, so pleased you could join us, and indicates a vacant seat very close to him. Eddie tries not to feel his cheeks burning. This is very bad. Gordon dramatically undersold his role on this mission. It's becoming horribly plain that these people are, effectively, the government of this ship. And Eddie appears to be a significant member of the cabinet. Now we are finally a quorum, blasts Gwent. We can get down to the business at hand. And a fairly filthy business it is. He leans forward. People, it seems we have an imposter in our midst. Almost 4am. Gordon reaches the corner of the alleyway that's been designated for the rendezvous. Perhaps this was a mistake... This location, with its stench of putrefaction and decay and death. Perhaps the whole idea is a mistake. He hears footsteps at the top of the alley clicking towards him. Steel tips on the shoe. For kicking people more effectively, Gordon supposes. The man is clearly a professional, which is good. The man speaks. Gordon? Charles Gordon? No names. Gordon shakes his head. I was very specific. Apologies. Politeness? Good. Gordon takes command. All right, we can have this over with very quickly. It has to look like an amateur beating. One blow to the face, one to the back of the head, a bruise and a lump. Nothing permanent, minimal pain. I was assured you were that good. There is an overlong, distressing pause... Then another set of footsteps, with the same metallic click of the toes. Gordon turns, alarmed. This second man has an expensive suit on, the effect of which is utterly undermined by his grotesque choice of socks. Fluorescent pink. He is also carrying a large bag, which he sets down on the floor. There is some equipment in the bag, large and metal. Gordon turns to the first man. This wasn't the arrangement. Why would it take two men to simulate a short fake beating? And what's in the bag? Another overlong pause, even more distressing. Then Gordon sees a fist travelling towards him. Something on it glints in the streetlight. Looks suspiciously like a knuckle dust. A bomb goes off on the bridge of his nose, and his septum explodes. All kinds of alarm bells are going off in his head. You're hurt. Get down, you fool. Get down. But he has no idea where down is. He might already be down, for all he can tell. His hand is touching something wet, stickily wet. The pain at the front of his face appears to be growing stronger and less bearable by the second. His sight peeks back after a fashion. He can see light and then a shadow against the light. And he sees a nose right in front of him. That's not his nose. That's someone else's. That nose has dark glasses perching on it. The mouth under the nose is moving. That's probably what's making the sound he can hear through the whooping siren of pain. Words. I'm sorry, sir. Did you say something? The mouth seems to want an answer. Gordon tries to respond. What? But the best he can muster is... Bleh? Until you say something, I can understand. I have to assume you want the job finished. Bleh. Do? Is that no? His vision is clearing now. There's a good deal of swelling under his eyes, but he can force them open enough to see the two men facing him. All right, Mr. Gordon. The fun is over now. Fun? That money you won at the casino, that was an administrative error. The girl was supposed to press a little button under her counter, but she was jostled. 
too many people around. That's bad luck for you. Gordon speaks badly, but well enough. No. Bad luck for the casino. Oh, come on, Pilgrim. You know who's running that establishment. You really think they'd let you walk away with fifty million? Those people. You clowns. Can't do this. Don't you know who I am? The two men smile at each other. We know exactly who you are. You are Mr. Charles Perry Gordon, and the beauty part is... You're not even here. The muscles in Gordon's cheeks, forced taut by the effort of keeping his eyes open, suddenly flop. This is bad. I can see you're keeping up. That's right. You are no longer on the planet. You're up on a spaceship. You're never coming back. Now, here are the bold facts. We will trace the money. Even if you've been very clever, and you probably have, we will track it down, and we will hack the security password. And then we're going to need two things to get the money back. That's right, says Gordon. You'll need something I have, and you don't. You can't get that money without a palm print and a retina scan. My palm print and my retina scan and the only... Gordon sees the assistant remove a sheathed samurai sword from his bag, and the terrible truth comes to him. That's right, Charlie. We're going to strip your assets, your hand, your eye. All you have left, the only bargaining point, is whether we do it pre- or post-mortem. Tears well up in his bruised eyes. <laughs> I'll cooperate. What do you want to know? The bank, the account number, the password. We can look up the sort code. Don't worry about that. Gordon takes out a notepad and a pen and starts to write and tries not to notice the sword sliding icily out of its sheath.